Hello, it's eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight on what has been an incredible evening unfolding in Westminster. We've seen MPs storming out of the Commons, a visibly emotional speaker apologising for his actions and calls for Sir Lindsay Hoyle to resign. I am and I regret with the deep... with my sadness that it's ended up on like that in this position that was never my intention for it to end up like this. We're going to get full analysis of what has happened from Sophie and the team in Westminster as Lindsay Hoyle is told his position is intolerable. Also tonight, calls to get tough on so-called lower level sexual offences. I'm going to be joined in the studio tonight by the mother of Libby Squire. Libby was murdered after a night out in 2019. Her killer's offending began with voyeurism and indecent exposure. The judge who jailed him for life said he felt emboldened because he hadn't been stopped. Reduced to tears, the King tells the Prime Minister that he's been touched by the good wishes he's received since his cancer diagnosis. Our Royal Correspondent Laura Bundock will be here. And how would you cope with winning the lottery? This is a couple from Lancashire celebrates a £61 million win. We'll take a look at the support and advice that's out there for new millionaires. All that to come and much more on The UK Tonight. OK, buckle up, because we can only start with one thing tonight, and that is the incredible scenes that have been unfolding in the House of Commons. The Speaker being told to resign over his handling of a vote on a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. Sir Lindsay Hoyle was accused by the government of undermining the confidence of the House and accused by the SNP of treating them with contempt. And that ceasefire vote, it didn't even end up happening. Well, Sophie Ridge is still in Westminster for us. Uh, Sophie, of course, you're going to hang around to, to talk to us about this because this has been extraordinary chaos in the House tonight. Explain to us exactly what unfolded. I'm still reeling, to be completely honest with you, uh, Sarah Jane, by what we've witnessed uh, in the last few hours in Parliament. The most serious of subjects, MPs wanting to express their opinions on what should happen in Gaza, whether there should be a ceasefire, whether Israel should be allowed to defend itself. That is what we're talking about tonight. It's really important to emphasise. Yet it has descended into a row about procedure, allegations that the Speaker has seemed too close to Labour, the SNP absolutely furious, other Conservative MPs saying that they're furious because they didn't get the chance to vote on what they wanted to. And to be honest, the whole thing has looked like a complete circus. But the thing that really matters is that the position of the Speaker has clearly been undermined by what has happened. Whether or not that's fatally undermined remains to be seen. And it is worth just watching Sir Lindsay Hoyle talk to MPs, apologising. He looked visibly shaken when he did so. I was very concerned, I am still concerned, and that's why the meetings I've had today is about the security of members, their families, and the people that are involved. And I've got to say, I regret how it's ended up. It was not my intention. I wanted the all. I want it all to ensure they could express their views and all sides of the House could vote. As it was, in particular, the <coughs> SNP were ultimately unable to vote on their proposition. I am, and I regret, with the deep... <laughs> with my sadness that it's ended up on like that, in this position, that was never my intention for it to end up like this. I was absolutely... <laughs> Absolutely convinced that the decision was done with the right intentions. I recognise, I, I recognise the strength of feeling of members on this issue. Clear today has not shown the House at its best. I will reflect on my. I will reflect on my part in that of the course. I recommit myself to ensuring that all members of this House are treated fairly. Absolutely extraordinary uh, scenes 
there. Well, let's bring in our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, and our chief political correspondent, John Craig. Uh, we saw there an apology from the speaker. He said he's going to be meeting with representatives from all of the main parties, effectively to try and cling on to his position, to regain his authority. Sam, where do you think we are right now? Lindsay Hall is in serious trouble tonight. He is fighting to keep hold of the position of Speaker of the House of Commons. After the scenes that we've seen in the last two hours, some breaking news for you, Sophie. There have been published an early day motion, that's a non-binding motion in the Commons, where people can express their views on something. The motion is about the future of Lindsay Hoyle as Speaker. 33 MPs have signed the early day motion calling for Lindsay Hoyle to go. The motion text is that this House has no confidence in Mr Speaker. There are some very significant names on that motion tonight, including Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 committee, other members of the 1922 committee, including Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. It's not just Conservatives. SNP MPs, including Joanna Cherry, Pete Wishart, Chris Lord, John McNally, they have also uh, all um, uh, signed this motion. Now, you could see that motion growing and growing, but that's not the only problem that the Speaker has. We have got the leader of the third biggest party, Stephen Flynn, all but saying he has no confidence in him. We have friends of Lindsay Hoyle, including John McDonnell, saying he is not sure that they can continue. And we have ministers on and off the record questioning his future. Ministers texting me saying that the bulk of Tory MPs think he should go. I wonder what happens tomorrow as Lindsay Hoyle reflects on what he has done today. Although he claims to have um, basically ripped up precedent in the House of Commons uh, for safety and security reasons, he ended up helping Labour, having been a former Labour MP at a moment of extreme vulnerability for Keir Starmer's party, causing fury across the House. It really looks quite tough for him at the moment. It's absolutely extraordinary how rapidly this story uh, is developing. And, John, I guess speakers only command the authority of the House of Commons, which is their entire job. If, if they don't have that, then they have nothing. If MPs have faith in their impartiality, in their ability to put their own beliefs, their own political uh, desires and inclinations to the side when they sit in that chair, I mean, uh, this is the issue, isn't it? Well, let's look at the demise of the... Two, the last two speakers. John Burko essentially had to go because he was seen to be partisan on the Brexit issue. His predecessor uh, was Michael Martin, and uh, he his downfall came about because he didn't deal adequately with the uh, expenses scandal of 2009 and the likes of David Cameron when he was in opposition. OK, he didn't force Michael Martin out, but there was a, mo a mood that Parliament needed cleaning up during the expenses scandal. Just reflecting, I mean, when you were talking, actually, Sam and I were both glued to the names uh, of I, could, I, th I knew something was going on. Yeah. I could tell by the chat. I mean, I've heard you, a few it, names, but I wasn't quite sure it's, what. <laughs> it's easy to dismiss early-day motions. Because I always called them Parliament's graffiti wall because, I mean, there's, it, MPs use them for... I know, some local issue congratulating their local football team in winning some match or something like that. But it is significant, the names. Not just Sir Graham Brady, but as, as Sam was saying. Now, the 1922 committee meets at 5 o'clock on a, on, a uh, on a Wednesday, committee room 14. Before that, the executive meets. Now, looking at these names, I think the executive probably had a bit of a chat about Lindsay because uh, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown... Uh, Gary Sandbrook, he's a member of the executive as well. Um, and also, uh, among senior Tories, uh, you've got uh, one of the party's deputy chairman, that's Brendan Clark-Smith here somewhere. Uh, I saw, yes, Brendan Clark-Smith, the MP for Bassett Law. Lee Anderson, who was until recently a deputy chairman as well. And then quite a lot of SNP names as well. Um, one of the people whose uh, name is on this list uh, texted me uh, late this afternoon and said, the EDM's gone down and it's gathering momentum. Gathering momentum, well, certainly You is. can argue mm. that 33 is not a huge number, but perhaps, I mean, the House has risen now, so probably there's not a chance for more MPs to sign it tonight. I tell you what, get the popcorn ready for business questions tomorrow. Uh, Why do you say that? When, uh, <laughs> when, when Penny Mordant... 
will be taking questions from MPs after her... I mean, that was a blockbuster intervention she made, and it was probably... I can imagine Lindsay Hoyle would have been watching. He wasn't in the chamber, it was Rosie Winter. He must have been watching that. A Penny Morden point of order in his room going, Ooh! You can imagine. <laughs> uh, um, well, as uh, John and Sam just bring us there, uh, really the move against Sir Lindsay Hoyle uh, is a gathering pace. MP signing a early day motion, an EDM um, effectively saying uh, that they have lost confidence in him. I want to play you now the moment when it really did feel that things had started to turn for Sir Lindsay Hall, and that is the intervention of Stephen Flynn, the Westminster leader of the SNP. This is what he said in the House of Commons earlier. Mr Speaker, whilst I acknowledge your apology, the reality is that you were warned by the clerks of the House that your decision could lead to the SNP not having a vote on our very own Opposition Day. As a result, we have seen the SNP Opposition Day turn into a Labour Party Opposition Day. I am afraid that that is treating myself and my colleagues in the Scottish National Party with complete and utter contempt. And it, I will take significant convincing that your position is not now intolerable. Yeah. Uh, Sophie, it's really interesting listening to you, John and Sam, discuss what's gone on this evening, but I can't help but think about what people outside the Westminster bubble who have been watching this unfold this evening, they tuned in to see a vote about the ceasefire um, and events in Gaza to find out what the UK's position will be. In all of this, that vote didn't even happen. So I'm just wondering, you know, what people at home will be thinking tonight about what this says about the UK to the rest of the world. To be honest, SJ, it's completely embarrassing, isn't it? That there, there's no two ways of looking at this. In many ways, the vote tonight was pretty meaningless anyway, even if they had taken place uh, in the way that they had expected them to, because it's not like a ceasefire would suddenly happen just because some MPs in Westminster call for it. And yet that didn't even take place. MPs weren't even given the ability to express their own opinions. The Houses of Parliament weren't even given the chance to make a statement about whether or not there should be a ceasefire. Instead, we've descended into this farce, I guess, a circus uh, in the House of Commons tonight. and. You know, your viewers and people at home, people across the country will have been seeing for months those agonising images and stories coming out of Gaza, the horror of the October the 7th attacks, and then you'll be looking at how our politicians in Westminster have responded, and I have to say, it is pretty unedifying. Yeah, our political editor, Beth Rigby, put out a post on social media. She's spoken to the Labour MP, Jess Phillips, um, in, uh, in the House, and... Jess Phillips said to her, how can we expect people to lay down arms if we can't even lay down words? Um, Sophie, thank you very much. More, much more analysis of what's been unfolding uh, in the House on our website, skynews.com. Also tonight, calls for tougher action on non-contact sexual offences. Now, these are crimes like voyeurism or indecent, indecent exposure, things still talked about flippantly at times. The offender referred to as a flasher or a peeping Tom. But campaigners say these offences are a gateway to the most serious sexual crimes and should be seen as red flags. More needs to be done to identify repeat perpetrators before their crimes escalate. According to the Home Office, the police in England and Wales recorded almost 12,500 cases of voyeurism or indecent exposure in the year to March 2022. As we know, the number of recorded incidents is often just a fraction of the true figure. And the Crime Survey for England and Wales estimates that in that same year, 198,000 people, that's men as well as women, were victims of indecent exposure. Young women are the most likely to be victims of non-contact sexual offences, with almost 17% of 16 to 19-year-olds experiencing this type of incident. Well, Libby Squire was abducted, raped and murdered while walking home from a night out in Hull in 2019. 
She was just 21 years old. Her killer's offending had begun as voyeurism, watching young women breaking into their homes to steal intimate items. The judge who sent him to prison for Libby's murder said he was emboldened to escalate his offences because he hadn't been stopped. Well, today, Libby's mum, who is calling for tougher sentences for these so-called lower-level crimes, took her campaign to Parliament. I never questioned as to why the police hadn't caught him because his, his offending was, was very different on, on, on each occasion. But I could see a link between his offending and then the eventual rape and murder of my daughter. And over the 18 months prior to her dying, he had escalated massively. And nobody seemed to know anything about it. Or it was still, to me, it still seen, was still seen as um, like the, the seaside postcard. Oh, you know, dirty old man flashed at you, you know. And it's not that. It's, it's incredibly serious. Not all non-contact sexual offenders will go on to rape and murder, but some do. And to me, you need to, if we can stop it here, then we're going to save women and girls from the absolute trauma of being raped. Lisa Squire is here with me in the studio tonight. Lisa, how are you? Big day for you. Yes, it's been busy. <laughs> yeah, giving <laughs> evidence like that. I just want to pick up on that final bit you were saying there in that clip we showed, which is about the attitude to non-contact sexual offences. I alluded to it in the intro. Men dismissed as peeping toms, you know, We've, we all heard it when we were younger about, you know, going to the park or watch out, there's a, a man that hangs around in the bushes there. It, you know, it, it was spoken in such flippant terms. But it's so serious. That's the starting point, isn't it? Getting attitudes to change, because it is a big deal. Yes, it really is a big deal. And even the term lower-level sex offences mm. diminishes it, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, they are sex offences. And, uh, yeah, we need to completely change the way we, we look and see look at these things and, and our attitudes towards them, mm. most definitely. Talk to me about the man who murdered Libby and in the investigation into her abduction, rape and murder, details came out about his history of offending and it was these, again, you hate to use the term, but they're classed as lower yeah. level offences. Talk to me about the picture that you put together of what was happening before he crossed paths with your daughter? Once we had all the information, you can quite clearly see an escalation from the lower end of the lower, mm -hmm. um, sort of lower crimes, right up until the weekend before he killed her, where he had escalated quite significantly. Um, and it was, it was kind of obvious that, that that was the trajectory he was taking and, you know, he was, he was going to do what he did to Libby, he was going to do that regardless. In the 18 months before Libby's murder, he was convicted of a series of non-contact sexual offences on women in Hull. Um, four offences of voyeurism, three counts of burglary, two counts of outraging public decency. In the three weeks before he got to Libby, he stalked young women at night and followed them home. Now, you've learned this after the event. This pattern has emerged, but these are the kind of patterns that need to be established to spot the men, not all of them, who go on to commit these serious crimes, but some of them do. And this is vital, isn't it, spotting these red flags? Absolutely. And the only way we can spot them is if women report them. So reporting is a massive part of it, mm. and actually then taking action, the police taking action when they've been reported. Women don't report these low-level offences. I want to find another word for it. Let's yeah. just call them offences. Offences. Yeah, women don't report them. They're dismissed. If they confide in someone, it's like, oh, it's no big deal, he didn't touch you, or there's no harm done. Yes. But it is a red flag. If a man is following you home at night, if a man is sending you unsolicited sexual content on your mobile phone, that is an offence and it should be reported because Absolutely. it helps build that pattern. It does, yes. And it's not normal behaviour. Normal men don't do these things. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely has to be reported. And you're not making something out of nothing. You are reporting what has happened to you. You also talk about tougher sentencing, not just for voyeurism and indecent exposure, but in the main for sexual crimes. I mean, your daughter 
is at the extreme end of the scale, abduction, rape and murder. Yeah. And her murderer was given a life sentence with a minimum of 27 years. He committed this crime when he was 24? 24. So he'll be out in his early 50s? Yes. How does that sit with you? Originally, I wasn't really bothered about the sentence. That's definitely changed now. Mm. Um, I don't think he should ever get out of prison. Um, when he comes out, as, as you said, he'll be in his early 50s, he'll have the chance to travel, to, you know, maybe marry again, to have children, to have a job. You know, he can do all those things that Libby never had the chance to do. And everybody knows you don't kill. You don't, you know, you, you, you don't do that. So if you do do that, to me, you should then forfeit your life by spending the rest of it in prison. It's just not just forfeiting a life that he stole from someone else. It's also, you believe, the risk of him re-offending. Because you talked today um, to MPs about treatment, treatment for sex offenders, and it being in a prison. Because you don't think that is happening, and that certainly won't be happening, you don't think, here. And that is oh, the no. risk, that if he gets yes. out in his 50s, he's presumably been in a prison surrounded by other sex offenders. That doesn't help someone not carry out these crimes. Absolutely. May just fuel it. Absolutely. I would have thought so, yes. I mean, the perpetrators of the lower level stuff, if we can... I, I do believe they have to be punished, mm. but I think if you can help them and unpick those patterns in their minds, then, you know, hopefully when they are released, they won't go on to reoffend. But um, Relevich, for instance, he will be in prison for... You know, best part of 30 years, like you say, with other sex offenders, his life will be all about sex offences. Mm. Um, and I can't see any reason why he wouldn't come out and uh, re-offend. Libby was the victim of a non-contact sexual offence just months before she was murdered. Can you tell me about that? What was the conversation like between the two of you after she told you it had happened? Yes, she, she was walking home with a friend and a man exposed himself to them. And as soon as she got home, she rang me and she was absolutely furious. She was like, how dare he think he can do that to me? So, you know, she was raging and, and really angry and we talked it through and calmed her down and sort of said, well, are you OK? And she said, yeah, I'm fine, but I'm really angry. Um, and, you know, we just said our usual goodbyes I didn't think to tell her to go and report it to the police. And she probably didn't think to go and... And she didn't to think to report it. I didn't know better then. Um, I do know better now. But, yeah, she... It was... And I think that is very standard. My reaction at the time was very standard. Um, it was very much, well, you're not her, you are OK. You know, you've talked it through. Do you want me to come and get you? She said, no, Mum, I'm fine, I'm fine. And we left and it at that. who knows what this man... Yeah. ..has gone on to do. Mm. And I think... Every woman watching this interview tonight will have had some experience of a non-contact sexual offence. I have. I didn't report it. Have you? I have, yes. And in my circle of friends, and I have quite a wide circle of friends, the majority of us have experienced a non-contact sexual offence. <sighs> to get authorities to take this seriously, women and the men <laughs> around women, fathers, husbands, sons, Attitudes need to change because, again, low-level offence, it isn't a low-level offence, it is an offence. Yeah, it's the starting block to, you know, the ultimate offence, I suppose. Mm. And, and it plays into misogyny. And I know you're very passionate about talking to men and young boys. And when you talk about receiving treatment in prison, sexual offenders, about unpicking the thread, unpicking the thread that has got them to, to a place of offending and finding out how that all started because yes. boys don't, you know, they're not born hating women, wanting to hurt women. No. Something happens along the Something way. Happens. And we need to retrain, the, re retrain their thoughts, you know, and, and, um, and help them with that, you know. I mean, I don't think there's enough help for men in general and then men, you know, Genu generally don't go and seek help, do they? W women do. We talk, we, you know, we talk things through with our girlfriends. Mm. I can't see a man saying oh, to, his, to his best mate, I've got this urge to go and expose myself. It doesn't happen. So we should be maybe... It's going to sound a bit strange, but maybe a, a bit understanding and give them the help that they require mm. or need. Not they require, they need. That's an incredible, incredibly generous thing to say given what's happened to your family and your daughter. Yeah, but, if, you know, if Relevich had had that help in the very first instant, 
you know, if, if there was help available then, he wouldn't have gone on... I would hope he wouldn't have gone on to do what he did mm. and I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. Tell us about Libby. She was amazing, is amazing, still is amazing. Um, fabulous family. Um, you know, very into her family. Very... Um, she was very funny, had loads of, you know, really... She was just amazing. I mean, a wonderful daughter, fantastic big sister. Yeah. You know, she was... And, and, incredibly generous and what you saw was what you got with Libby mm. and she was just you know she was yeah she was like the there's there's obviously six of us in our family and now there's only five you know physically here but she's still very there'll present. always be six yeah she's still very present and um yeah she's she's left a huge hole there's, there's a huge hole been left in our family but you know it, the children are amazing and mm. you know it's all it's yeah it's different but it I keep well, I can see where she got her, her generosity oh, of spirit you. from, um, you. and you're doing her proud by, you, you know, standing up for women and girls, um, talking about non-contact sex crimes and the importance yeah. of reporting Report. them. Don't dismiss them, report them. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much thank and you. good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now the King has today says he uh, has said he has been reduced to tears by the good wishes he received from the public after his cancer diagnosis. He made these comments to the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in his first face-to-face -face engagement since starting treatment. The Prime Minister, Your Majesty. Good evening, Your Majesty. Very nice to see you. And wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah, a bit, but I'm wonderful. Afraid. Wonderful to see you looking so well. No, well it's all done by mirrors. Really. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're, all, we're all behind I you. The country's behind you. Home. I know, because I've had so many wonderful messages and cards. And I can imagine. It's reduced me to tears most of the time. Well, I can imagine. But every, no, I said everyone is behind you. Well, you're and uh, it's also, it's been nice to see the spotlight that it's shone on the work that charities do. Well, in this area, which, uh, which I'm sure you'll yeah. see about the Maybe I hear that there's been a lot more attention, interest on the, those main wonderful cancer charities, yeah. many of which I've been patient of for years. <laughs> they do incredible work up and down the country. They do. So. They do. Well, at that point, the cameras were booted out because, of course, the men had a lot to discuss. Uh, Laura, Laura Bandok, our royal correspondent, is here because they haven't met for 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. So a lot to go through. I know. And think what a kind of 10 weeks it's been, really. The amount of health news, we, you know, everything going on. Personal so, and business discussed at this meeting, no doubt. All of that. And, you know, it, the fact the King allowed a camera in mm. is, is really unusual. But it reminds us that these are particularly unusual times, mm -hmm. aren't they? I mean... What did we learn from this? What did we see? Well, we saw the king, for starters, because we haven't seen much of him recently. Um, we learned that he'd been moved by all the well-wishers who'd passed on, you know, wishes of kind of support and, and, and all the cards and messages. But he seemed in pretty good spirits. I think this decision to, to show us into the audience is certainly significant. And, and the king would have approved it. The king knows, as his late mother often used to say, you have to be seen to be believed. And mm. the trouble is, with his cancer diagnosis and treatment, that's just not been possible. He's been advised by the medics not to carry out public-facing engagements. That doesn't mean he's not carrying on behind the scenes mm. with, with the state business, including these weekly audiences which get paused at Christmas normally anyway and Parliament isn't sitting as well so that 10 week kind of accounts for a lot of that um, but you know what goes on between a monarch and their prime minister is always private stays mm. within palace walls doesn't it and so I think this openness with this moment is another reflection of the king's you know decision to go public when it came to his prostate diagnosis his cancer diagnosis and, and I had think, a bit of reassurance as well I think so I mean you know he, he's been very open hasn't he I think the problem is there is always a danger mm. in letting photographers the cameras into moments like this is there'll be a lot of scrutiny, intense scrutiny yeah. about how he is. And remember, there's a lot we don't know about the King's cancer diagnosis. We don't know the prognosis. We don't know what kind of treatment he's, he's um, having at, uh, at the moment either. So I think for now, this is the image the palace wants to project, that it's business as usual. But as we know, it's anything but at the moment. OK, Laura, thank you. Uh, Laura Bunduk, our role correspondent there. Still to come on the UK tonight, a victory for patients or unworkable. We're going to discuss Martha's Rule, the scheme to give NHS patients the right to an urgent review or a second opinion.
Hello, welcome back. Now, the NHS in England is going to roll out Martha's Rule from April. This will give patients and their families access to a rapid review of their care or a second opinion. The scheme is named after 13-year-old Martha Mills, who died after developing sepsis while in hospital in South London in 2021. She developed sepsis while under the care of King's College Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. And this has been hailed as a victory for patients. But the health service, as we know, is already facing unprecedented strain. So just how is this scheme going to work in practice? Well, I'm joined now to discuss Martha's rule by the founder of the UK Sepsis Trust and intensive care doctor, Ron Daniels, and Melissa Mead, who lost her son to sepsis almost 10 years ago now. Uh, good evening to you both. Thank you so much for coming on to the UK tonight. Um, I'll come to you first, if I may, uh, Melissa. What was your reaction to this rule being put into place? It's going to go to two-thirds of hospitals initially um, to implement this scheme. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to welcome the opportunity for um, parents or loved ones of, of, and carers to be able to speak up when they don't feel like they're being listened to. Um, we completely understand that, um, you know, perhaps in... A, a very, very business, um, a, a very busy environment such as a hospital, um, we don't always feel the opportunity to do that. So having a safe place to be able to do that, I think is always going to be welcome. Melissa, what was your experience when your son William was being treated? Were you listened to? Um, not really. Um, we went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards to the doctor a number of times. Um, and I think if we'd have had or been aware of the opportunity to have a second opinion, um, we would have grabbed it with both hands and William perhaps might be alive today. That is really hard to hear. Um, Dr Daniels, a lot of people will be surprised that this option for patients, this opportunity to advocate for themselves if they know something is not right or if their families want someone else to take a look because they want a second opinion, isn't there already? Well, technically, this has been in place really since the NHS evolved, um, but it's not been visible. And often barriers have been put in place if people have asked for a second opinion. This is about legitimising it, formalising it, making it really visible and kind of removing those barriers, smoothing the path to access that second opinion. And in most cases of people deteriorating, such as Martha with sepsis, their care will be led by a junior doctor. Where that junior doctor or nurse is switched on, they don't need a second opinion. This is for when that process isn't happening, where they feel that their loved one is being let down. There may be some concern, Dr Daniels, that, you know, this is probably why patients aren't tough enough when they go into hospital, they're vulnerable anyway. H how do they know better than a doctor who studied for years in whatever, you know, treatment they're receiving? It's this reluctance to kick up a fuss, isn't it? It's very British. Um, and I just wonder, a lot of patients may have been reluctant because they think they'd upset the doctor. It would affect their care. And there is a chain of thought that this isn't going to go down well with doctors. What would your response be to that to alleviate those fears? So I, I think the first thing to say is that I didn't train at medical school around your loved one. You know your loved one mm. much, much better than I do. And you are best placed to advocate for your loved one. And if you're not empowered to do it, that might make the difference between your loved one coming home or not coming home. So I think, I think it's really important to understand that although health professionals know a lot about medicine, know a lot about the body, they don't know your loved one. And it really is that important. Now, I work across a couple of hospitals. In one of those hospitals, in my intensive care role, I would quite readily have time to come and offer that second opinion. And personally, I'm only speaking for myself, I would find that a rewarding, enjoyable, and hopefully, uh, bolstering of patient safety experience. In the other hospitals, sometimes I might find it more challenging to do that because my time is a little more constrained. And we have to work out not only whether this can be delivered, but also how it should be delivered. Yeah, that's important, isn't it? And you make a very good point. Every hospital is different in terms of resource. Every ward is different. Every, you know, clinician is different. Melissa, what did you find when you were trying to get a second opinion, someone to listen to you? Because 
Hopefully there is now going to be a structure in place for you to be listened to. But what was your experience when you were trying to talk to someone and trying to get help for William? Um, I think I think what, what, what Ron said is that is right, is I knew William, me and his dad knew William more than anyone. And yeah. we were saying he's just not right, he's just not right. And I can't put my finger on it, but I know that this is very different to his normal. And when I'm raising a concern or a worry, it doesn't, it's not a complaint. It's merely that I'm searching for answers that I don't have. And I want someone to verbalize that or to put that into words for me, to give me reassurance, um, to keep my son safe or to keep me safe. Um, and I, I just think that's very, very difficult when you, you just feel like it's a them and us process and it can be very transactional. Um, sometimes within the NHS because everyone is very busy and yeah. you often get very little opportunity to be able to speak to a doctor or consultant um, and you don't want to sort of sit in a hospital bed and put your hand up almost and say oh excuse me excuse me um, you you feel as though you are a nuisance and I just feel like that like Ron said that barrier has to be removed yeah. the toxic culture of thinking that that doctors know best and that that we're just I, I I don't know what the word would be but you know there's no one that knew William better than me and his dad and he might be alive if we listened to so well this has come too late for little William but this really does give hope for other families <sighs> Dr Daniels in practice how is this going to work the NHS is so stretched can can it deliver on this pledge well, I think, again, it's going to be easier for some hospitals to deliver this than others. I mean, if we take one example, there are brilliant nurses around the country in hospitals delivering intensive care services to the wards via the critical care outreach team. Now, in lots of hospitals, that's a 24-7 service, and therefore there wouldn't be any difference between a day or a night or a bank holiday weekend in those organisations. But in some, it's a 12-7 service or even an office hours service. And what happens if Melissa comes in with William on a Sunday during a bank holiday weekend in those organisations? Mm -hmm. Again, it's down to the hospitals who have a desire to implement this to work out how they're going to do it, how they're going to resource it, who's going to deliver the extra assessments. We hope that they're not going to be many, and we absolutely agree with Murray P. Mills, Martha's mum, that this is not going to be overused. But can we make sure that the service is reliable? That demands resource. Well, it's really good to talk to you about it. Dr Daniels, thank you so much. And Melissa Mead, uh, thank you so much. Um, Martha's rule comes into force in the UK uh, in a, a large number of hospitals in April of this year. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, residents have been evacuated from homes in Plymouth after a suspected World War II bomb was found in a garden. Devon and Cornwall Police declared a major incident and evacuated properties within a 200 metre radius of the wartime device in the Keyham area of the city. Well, the cordon is still in place tonight and Plymouth City Council say it will remain in place until the morning with specialist explosive teams at the scene. We spoke to a resident of the area a little earlier today who is at risk of being evacuated. I've got a disabled husband and there's no, at the minute, there's no planning action for of how I'm going to get him out because he hasn't been out of the house for six years. So it will be difficult because it takes four people to lift him down the stairs. Plus he's got loads of electronic equipment and he's got motor neuron disease. So he's non-verbal and I've had to have a day off work as well. So I can't move the car and can't go out and do any shopping. But there is, um, but they say that the cordon's going to be expanded a bit more. The actor and comedian Ewan McIntosh, best known for playing Big Keith in The Office, has died at the age of 50. The creators of The Office, Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant, have been leading the tributes today, Gervais calling him an absolute original. His character, the accountant Keith Bishop, became a cult figure in his own right, known for his monotone delivery and his love of Scotch eggs and this infamous appraisal. Under strengths, you've just put accounts. Yeah. That's your job, though. That's just... That's just... Mm. 
No, Keith. I was sort of looking for your skills within your job, so is there anything else you could have put there? No. Oh. Okay. Um, under weaknesses, you've put eczema. <laughs> Still to come on the UK tonight. The new Manchester United co-owner, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, says that he wants to knock Man City off their perch. We'll have the latest with our sports correspondent next. And what would you do with £61 million? Uh, we'll be taking a look at what help there is on offer for lottery winners. We're delighted to be uh, reopening. As you say, we've been closed for the last two years. It's uh, normally a very popular... Uh, tourist destination and we've needed to close just because we've had avian flu we just thought that was the right thing to do at that time. Well again harking back to 2022 we had 6,000 carcasses were picked up by uh, by staff on the islands. Last year delighted to say the numbers reduced by 39% down to uh, just over three and a half thousand. Um, so whilst we can't conclude too much out of that, at least the trajectory seems to be about right. Um, we're going to need another season at the very least just to find out if that's still uh, descending, going in the right direction. But uh, at the moment, the clues are that uh, it's looking a little bit better. And what we do know is that uh, uh, across the UK at the moment, avian flu is uh, at a much lower uh, prevalence than it certainly has been. What we found is that uh, the incidence of avian flu occurring across the country varies really quite considerably. So it might be quite prevalent on the East Coast, it's been less than the West Coast, it's been here, it's been there, and even between sort of neighbouring islands, so upstream as it were and downstream of us here on the East Coast, we've seen big, big differences in, in the prevalence of, uh, of avian flu. So it is difficult to tell, but as I say, what we do know is that the prevalence at the moment is very low. Yes, we're opening up uh, later in March, absolutely. What they'll be seeing is, is as, you're, as you're showing there, um, we'll be into Arctic turn season. That's the big one. That's that's one of the big draws, certainly. You've already mentioned puffins, of course. That's a particularly kind of favoured little bird. Everybody loves a puffin, I think. Um, yeah, so they'll be, uh, there we go. Uh, puffins will be uh, kind of landing up uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, Arctic terns will be here about mid-March, so about this time next year, starting to lay their uh, their eggs. Um, and, uh, OK, it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, but uh, if you want to come visit and get dive-bombed by Arctic terns, then uh, that's what will be happening from, uh, say, in about a month's time. They, they have this uh, kind of very clear, bright uh, blue strip uh, when they're in the breeding season, but uh, that does fade. It does fade later. So they, they go out to sea um, later in the year, uh, at the end of the summer, and, uh, and kind of, uh, yeah, tone themselves down. They don't need to be quite so bright and showy as they, as they are. Uh, on the way, how would you cope with winning the lottery? You'd probably think very well. Um, we're going to chat to a financial advisor to jackpot winners in a few minutes' time, because there are a few pitfalls, apparently. Uh, first, Sir Jim Ratcliffe has vowed to knock Manchester City off their perch. This is after his stake in Manchester United was officially confirmed. Sir Jim, who is taking over all football operations at Old Trafford, was speaking to media in London this afternoon. Amongst them, our sports correspondent Rob Harris, who joins us now. Rob, so a little sit down with Sir Jim to get all the details about his plans for Manchester United. Uh, what did he tell you? Well, how was going to take Manchester United back to the Fighting summer? Talk straight away. <laughs> yeah. How many how many years did we talk about United winning everything, yeah. being all conquering, and then all the trophies dried up once Sir Alex Ferguson retired, what, eleven years ago now, and since then Manchester City becoming the dominant force. And he mentions City's name a lot because he sees them as the club now to, to emulate. Yeah, he's uh, got that competitive spirit. What were his other plans? Because he talked a lot about Old Trafford, the theatre of dreams, and that might be getting a revamp or it might be something new completely in the coming years. Yeah, it has been a bit dated now compared to other stadiums. Yeah, it's one of the first super stadiums, wasn't it, way back when in the 90s, yeah. And it's got all the history of Best, Lord Charlton, yeah, yeah. you know, Ronaldo, Rooney in recent years, and the people who don't want to bulldoze that history. And intriguingly, when we're talking about redevelopment, and we can be very focused on the men's team, I said, you know, would you build a stadium for the women's team? Yes, Rob. And he said, 
actually, we might use the existing Old Trafford for the women's team okay. while building a new stadium on the site, mm -hmm. 90,000 seats potentially, for the men's team predominantly. But he hopes for public investment, which might go down badly with some people, but he, he linked it to the levelling up agenda to HS2 being stopped at Birmingham, mm -hmm. saying the North loses out, it's London that gets things like the Olympic project. So he believes there should be investment there, but some might question why a wealthy football club we need public funds to go into that. Yeah, with a wealthy co-owner. Um, OK, Rob, interesting. Watch this space. I know you're following that story closely. Rob Harris there with the latest on Manchester United. Thanks, Rob. We'll see you soon. Uh, right, we're going to get the rest of the sport now. Teddy, standing by. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. What we're going to do is play a little game called fill the blank. So all uh, you've got to do is I'm going to read out a sentence. You're going to write down the word okay. to fill it in. We're going to trust your spelling. Uh -huh. I'm going to help yeah. you out if you don't know. Okay. I probably won't uh, be able to, but no. I'll try my best. So yeah, just write down the word to finish the sentence. The first okay. one is playing for Manchester United is. Just get rid of that. Bit. It's fine. Yeah, just turn it around. I think I saw it right. Let's have a look. Incredible. Incredible. You have to start that right. Don't uh, worry. Yeah. Talk to me about, then about the last 10 years and how you kind of feel like you've developed and changed during that time? Um, no, nah, first of all, it's, you know, I put down incredible because it's one of the biggest clubs in the world, if not the biggest. Um, and it's obviously a real honour to, to be here for so long. Um, you know, it's kind of my home now because I've been here so long and of course there's been a lot, lot of ups and downs, but, you know, I'm incredibly happy of you know, the times I've had here, the good times and, you know, for me, I'm, I'm very ambitious and I think there's still a lot more, you know, that I want to achieve here. Well, that leads me nicely on to the next one then and that is the aim for this season is... Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, just turn it around to us. Win the FA Cup and Champions League qualify. Qualify for the yeah. Champions League. How's that changed during kind of the course of the season? Because obviously you're Manchester United, you must sit around every oh, year of course, to win a trophy and yeah, be competing at the top of the table. I think obviously at the start of the season that wouldn't be our ambitions. I think of course at the start of the season we want to win the Premier League, the Champions League. We want to win everything. Um, but I think at this point right now we have to be a bit more realistic on the position where we're at. So I think for, for us now, you know, the Champions League is, of course, a club like this has to be in the Champions League. Um, and, you know, like I said, uh, we're in the FA Cup competition at the moment. And, yeah, I think we have to be realistic and look at, you know, what we can achieve this season. I think these two should, should of course, be our aim. So my next one is Hoyland will become. Turn it around for me then. Hoyland will become. One of the best. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Right, let's have a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Unsettled again tomorrow, turning colder as well as an increasingly northerly flow brings temperatures nearer the seasonal average. Before then, most places fine if windy this evening, but Scotland Island and Northern Ireland will see blustery showers. Southern Britain looking rather murky and damp tonight. The north and the west will see showers, wintry on the peaks. The southeast of Ireland, Wales and western England will see more general rain and gusty winds moving through, largely clearing to southwest and central England later. It's going to turn cold in the north and west with a frost in places. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, it's that weird or wonderful part of the evening here on the UK tonight. And uh, I want you to think about how you would cope if you won the lottery. A couple from Lancashire went public today after winning £61 million on the Euro Millions. Richard and Debbie Nuttall, congratulations to them. They were in the Canary Islands celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary when an email popped through from the National Lottery telling them there was exciting news about their ticket. I'd logged in and it was, uh, I'd seen there was a win. Didn't look at the date, I just looked at it and there was a £2.60 win there. So. I said to Debbie, you know, we've won £2.60. She said, great, let's go and have a bacon butty or something, <laughs> you know, celebrate. And, uh, and then later on in the day, another email arrived, exactly the same message. I thought, there's a glitch. 
And uh, uh, so I logged in again, and, and there's a message there saying you've won £61,708,231 and call this number. And, and that's, that's how we found out. And then we had, you know, tried to ring and had problems with the phone signal and so on and so on, and, you know. It is a truly mind-boggling amount of money, isn't it? So exactly what help is out there to help people like Richard and Debbie suddenly rich beyond their wildest dreams to negotiate the weeks, months, years ahead? Uh, well, I'm joined now by Robin Melly. He is a financial advisor who has worked with more than 100 jackpot winners. Uh, Robin, good to see you this evening. What's the first thing you say to a new millionaire? Well, there are three bits of advice that we give them initially. Um, the first one doesn't really apply to Debbie and Richard, and that is uh, maintain your anonymity, uh, at least until you've taken professional advice. The second piece of advice is to, is to really just pause and reflect mm. and put the money in a safe place on deposit. Uh, and the third thing that's really important is to take professional advice from somebody who's suitably qualified um, and in fact, most of the pitfalls seem to emanate from not doing those three things. OK, well, they haven't done the first thing, have they? They've gone public. Why do people go public? I can see the benefits in it, because if somebody's won 61 million, then, then obviously their lifestyle is, is going to visibly change. <laughs> so, you know, there is an argument to actually go public and, and manage it. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a better way. Um, but the general principle is that, I mean, there are lots of uh, jackpot winners that don't go public, you know, they maintain their anonymity. I mean, our typical advice is to, you know, maintain your anonymity, at, le at least until you, that initial euphoria has died down and you've had the opportunity to reflect mm. and take professional advice. Yeah, I mean, stop, reflect, don't rush out and buy that Lamborghini or book the swimming pool to be built uh, the next week. I was interested there with you saying, put your money in a safe place. You would assume the bank would be a safe place. I mean, you see them there with that massive giant cheque. I, I, I think everybody can accept that you don't take that down to your local bran branch of Barclays or NatWest and, and cash it. But where is a safe place for their money? Well, initially, it's got to go into a bank but we've got the financial services compensation limit of 85,000. So with 61 million, potentially you're spreading across, you know, lots of... I can of... imagine alarm bells ringing at banks, people picking yeah. up phones, the, th the fraud team on the phone to you. Yeah, there is, there is one bank where, where you don't have to worry about the FSCS limits, um, but you're, you're restricted to, I think, 4 million. So it wouldn't be a suit for all of Debbie and Richard's money. But nevertheless, we would suggest spreading it across a number of banking institutions um, and give yourself time for that euphoria to die down and to start to understand some of the opportunities that are available. And certainly if it's handled in a professional way, then jackpot winners can use the resource to really create a wonderful life and a legacy for the whole family that goes on through the generations by not taking advice, then sometimes they trip up um, some of the pitfalls and, and end up in a very, a very uh, disappointing place sometimes. Um, we've got about, how long have we got? We've got 30 seconds. Um, can you explain to me in 30 seconds, sudden wealth syndrome? Yeah, it's, it's something that Dr. Goldbart uh, really wrote about in the States, but it's, it's not to be uh, overlooked because there is a, an emotional response when, when somebody wins a huge amount of money that, uh, that is life-changing, then it, it impacts on relationships. People start to feel some of those negative emotions once they've gone past that initial euphoria. I mean, oddly, people become really anxious about losing it. Yeah, and um, and it really can uh, sort of swamp their thinking. So it's really important to understand it. Okay, well, Robin, really good to talk to you. Thank you so much for advising us on what we should do if it should happen to you. Thank you.